Hello, my friends, and welcome in on the inaugural, the initial, the day, no, I'm going to call it the groundbreaking episode of the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacey Hervella and Rick Weiss. Stacy, I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am. It, it's a privilege for me to be able to do this show with you. Well, I can't say enough that I feel likewise. It's uh, it's actually happening. We're here, and we are so excited to share our love of plants and gardening with all of the listeners, new and returning. Absolutely. So, Stacy, for our listeners, give them an idea. How did you get here? Where have you been? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've been right here in West Michigan working for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And, uh, you know, I'm a lifelong gardener. I always love gardening. I've been gardening since I was a child. But I didn't realize until I was in college studying linguistics at the University of Michigan that what I really wanted to do was be a gardener. And so I packed everything up and I moved to New York City and I went to horticulture school at the New York Botanical Garden School of Professional Horticulture, which is an excellent two-year program. I worked as a uh, rooftop gardener. I worked as the horticulturist at the former Tavern on the Green restaurant. I worked as a garden editor at Martha Stewart Living. And now I'm here helping people uh, grow Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Wow, that's fantastic. For me, uh, you know, 25 years as Mr. Green Thumb with the ABC affiliate in West Michigan, uh, close to 30 years with iHeartMedia Wood Radio doing a call-in radio show, and 46 years with an independent garden center right here in West Michigan. So, you know, I've always felt when it comes to gardening questions, I've heard it all, but no, I, there's something new all the time. There really is. And Rick, you know, I got to say, you got some serious chops there. So (laughs) I think between the two of us, we're going to be able to simplify gardening for everybody. And that really is our goal is to uh, not just share our love of plants and gardening, but talk about why you can uh, make plants a part of your everyday life as well. And yeah, we're going to have a lot of questions. And that's an important part of this show uh, is that people are able to ask the questions that they have and get answers from us that they can use and apply uh, right away to make their gardens better. Yeah, so the Gardening Simplified show. Simplified. Things that you and I deal with, Stacey, like deer. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Do not get me started. (laughs) Do we really want to start our inaugural show with with a deer rant? But but it is something we both uh, deal with extensively. They they nipped the heads off my verbenas, snapped off some cannas. Uh, They they went up the front steps to munch on my morning glories this morning. So... You know, we're going to try and help folks out with things like that. Oh, and Stacy, I you know, I'm amazed. Botanical names or pronouncing names of plants, they just roll off your tongue. Whereas I'm more of the everyday gardener where it's a little more difficult for me. You know, for example, Wygella or Wygela or what is it? And and I know from you watching you on YouTube that it is not Wygelia. We nope. don't put an I in there before the A, right? That is correct, despite <laughs> what many people think. Now, I, now you heard me say that I was a linguistics major. So all of this uh, exactly. botanical <laughs> nomenclature thing does come from, uh, derive from that background. Um, but I do want to say, first of all, yes, there are correct ways to pronounce a botanical name. But the most important thing about language, and this also comes from being a lis- linguistics major, is that language Uh, gets you what you need to get. So if you walk into a garden center and you do end up saying Wygelia or Wiggla. Give me some of those wiggly things. (laughs) Any of the number of mispronunciations (laughs) that I'm sure you've heard over the years. uh, The important thing is that they get you what you want. So yeah, I can get a little bit pedantic about it uh, (laughs) and I probably will, but that doesn't mean that you need to be as well. It's just, you know, I think that that botanical names are really fascinating. And, you know, when we talk about Wygela, it's derived actually from the German name Weigel, and it just has the A attached. It's, it's a uh, salute to that person who, you know, the person named the, the Wygela for. Um, and so, you know, I want to keep that name connected to it because it does, you know, it's an honorific for a specific person. I can already tell we're going to have a lot of fun with this. Yes. And I'm going to call them Wygela, uh, like my Monet or spilled wine. Beautiful. Yes, in yeah. the landscape. You know, this this past week in the news, uh, I picked up on the fact that there was a news anchor that had the audacity to say the word 
irregardless. And people went crazy in social media. But, Stacey, it was interesting. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary came to the defense of this news anchor saying it is a word. Now, not necessarily a good word, not slang, but it was classified as non-standard. So it doesn't mean it's not a word or even a bad word, but you likely don't want to use it in your writing at school or at work. Yeah, I I am not going to use that, but <laughs> I will not judge you if you do. Like I said, language exists to be understood. And if I you're being it. understood, we're all good. Coming up on today's show in our next segment, Stacy's going to introduce us to a blooming beauty you probably are going to want in your yard. We're we're going to call that segment Plants on Trial, Stacy, and boy, you've got a great plant for our first week here. I do. I'm going to be going in depth about Oh So Easy Peasy Rose, which is one of the 320 plus Proven Winners Color Choice varieties. And the reason that I'm picking that particular rose to feature as our very first plant on trial uh, is because it looks absolutely breathtaking, incredible in our trial gardens here in West Michigan right now. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand or don't are surprised to find out that roses really come into a second season in September. Here we are at the end of uh, the beginning of September. And, um, you know, people think of roses at the height of summer, but September, they get a second wind that you would not believe. So we're going to go into depth about Oh So Easy Peasy Rose, why you should grow it, and the fascinating story behind how it got here. Looking forward to that. In the second segment, you know, when I started in the garden center industry 46 years ago, roses were not easy peasy. So I'm looking forward uh, to that. Uh, talk about simplified our third segment. We're going to go to the mailbag. And yes, I said mailbag because I'm a baby boomer and you don't have to send us snail mail. We've got a way that you can send us your questions, but we do have some initial questions here for the show. And of course it's going to involve pruning Budlia and, hydrangeas are notorious for people scratching their head going, how am I going to prune these? So looking forward to answering our listeners' questions. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I'll say right off the bat, if you do have a question for us, we would love to hear from you. You can visit our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Or you can just shoot us an email at help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and we will get you the answer that you need because uh, that's what we love to do. You know, a lot of people think, oh, if I ask a question, I'm being a burden on them. Um, But, you know, absolutely. To me, the greatest reward in what I do as a horticulturist is help people. You know, I, I put out a lot of information to people, but when I can engage directly with someone and give them the advice that they need to be successful, that's what I really love. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and Rick and I would be happy to uh, give you our own expert perspective. Well, and that's the whole reason I'm here. I like plants and I like people. So I guess it works out. Uh, it works out all right. So yes, uh, send us your questions, as Stacy said, gardening simplified on air.com. And you can send those questions to help at gardening simplified on air.com. And Stacy, if people look for us and proven winners, color choice shrubs uh, in social media, if they remember PW Color Choice, that's a good way to find you in social media, correct? Yeah, whatever your preferred poison for social media, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, Twitter, I don't know what all I'm forgetting, but uh, you will find us at the handle PW Color Choice. We would love to have you as part of our community. It's a great place to learn about gardening and to find your next favorite plant, no matter what your experience level. I think that um, it's it, you'll find something that's really beautiful and inspiring and let's face it, plants are a really nice break from social media, which can be a little oh bit my. of a drag at times. Oh my, exactly. And you know, in our final segment, we're going to take a look at news, nature, landscape, plant news, not breaking news. I'm going to call it branching news, okay? Oh, I like that. No breaking news on this show. Uh, coming up in that final segment, example, uh, hot spots for monarch butterflies. They're migratory way stations in Michigan. There's a couple of hot spots. We're going to share that with you. Did you know you can get paid to pick pine cones? Talk about a gig economy. I didn't, but I know my neighbor's grandkids love to pick up the pine cones in my yard. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that in our news segment. And would you rip up your lawn for $6 a square foot? Yes. I, knew I know you weren't asking me, that. but yes, the answer is yes. Well, in a way I was asking you, but I knew <laughs> what the answer was going to be. And we would plant some beautiful flowers and flowering shrubs uh, in lieu of a lawn. But would you do it for $6 a square foot? I think I would 
also. So all those news items we will share with you and lots of great plant information. We appreciate you tuning in to the Gardening Simplified show. And uh, again, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And if you want to send us a question, help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a quick break. And then after this, Stacy's going to introduce us to that beautiful rose. Don't miss it. You're going to want this plant in your yard. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show with Rick Weist and Stacey Hervella. Uh, we are back with our Plants on Trial segment. Now, we're going to each week bring you a feature on one of the 320 plus proven winners color choice shrubs. And what, we're, what I'm going to do is talk about what the plant looks like, what the story is behind it, why you should grow it, and how you should grow it. So the trialing part of Plants on Trial comes partly from the fact that we here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs do trial and test all of our plants for an average of 8 to 10 years uh, to make sure that they outperform anything else on the market. That happens in our R&D facility and our trial fields right here in West Michigan. But the other part of Plants on Trial comes, of course, when you try them out in your garden. And, you know, I think that's a useful way to think about gardening is that it's a constant audition for um, what are the main characters, what parts are they going to play in your landscape, and you can really treat your garden that way. It doesn't have to be such a static thing that never changes and that you've committed for the whole your whole life to have this plant in that one spot. I mean, I think uh, for, for me, one of the best parts about gardening is trying out new plants. And, you know, everyone's got a limited amount of space, so uh, there is a trial aspect to all of our gardening journeys. Well, I'll tell you what, with all that said, Stacy, you had me at oh so easy. <laughs> and you know, we do have a series of roses called oh so easy. And the reason that they're called oh so easy is because we wanted them to be super easy to grow. So we've done extensive trialing for disease resistance and performance. And the rose that we're featuring this week is oh so easy peasy. Uh, and this, the reason that I'm, I'm talking about it this week, you might be thinking like, hey, it's September. Why are we talking about roses? Roses are a summer thing. But the fact is that roses really have a second wind or a second season in September. So Oh So Easy Peasy Rose does bloom continuously through summer. But what you'll see on Oh So Easy Peasy, as well as almost all continuous blooming roses, is that in September... Uh, when the days start to get a little bit shorter and the temperatures start to get a little bit cooler, they just come roaring back and the color is much more vivid. The plants are much more floriferous. And I have to tell you, if you could see Oh So Easy Peasy Rose in our trial garden right now, you would already, before I even said anything else about it, be rushing out to the garden center to get your own. And while I cannot show you what it looks like right here on air, what you can do is go to our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and click on the show notes, and you will see a photo of it, and I will take that photo personally from our trial garden. So that is a real unedited photo of what it looks like right now. And I'll tell you, you won't believe your eyes because it is absolutely covered in um, the, the flowers are small, but super numerous, and they are the color of dragon fruit. Have you ever seen a dragon fruit? Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. so you know they're super duper bright, just like this almost like fluorescent magenta-y pink color. Um, so even though the flowers are very small, they're super intensely colored, and they absolutely cover the plant. Now, one thing that I have found uh, observing this plant over the seasons in our trial garden that's really interesting about it is that it has waves of flowers. So a lot of reblooming roses, you know, they bloom in June when they're supposed to, look amazing. And then they kind of, okay, here's a couple of flowers in July. Here's a couple of flowers in August. But oh so easy peasy just absolutely explodes with these waves of blooms. So instead of just having those couple here and there, it's positively covered in those flowers in waves. And you don't need to cut it back. You don't need to deadhead. And it just does that on its own. Well, Stacy, would you, would you consider this what we would call a landscape rose? Because in today's day and age, you know, years ago, again, when I came into the industry years ago, we were doing the Floribunda grafted hybrid tea roses with the landscape roses. This is almost like a ground cover rose. It's floriferous. And I've, in my experience, um, learned that people think about shutting down the season 
for roses way too early. They can be beautiful all the way into October and November. This rose would fit the bill, right? Yeah. And, you know, you say it can be beautiful into November. Uh, roses often do continue to bloom even after a couple frosts. So even here in West Michigan, when we're getting those frosts in October and November, that doesn't necessarily stop a rose from blooming. But yeah, I, we would consider this a landscape rose. And a landscape rose basically just means that it's a low maintenance durable rose. You're not going to need to dust it and labor over it. It really, you can plant it and treat it just like anything else in your landscape, which is to say you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, now, this rose came to us from a plant breeder, Dr. David Zlesak in Wisconsin. So he is a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and he has been breeding roses since he was a kid. And in fact, when he was 13 years old, he reached out to a gentleman named Will Radler. And if you're not familiar with that name, Will Radler is the developer of Knockout Rose. Oh, yeah. So David Zlesak, you know, heard about Will Radler and was very interested in his story and his rose breeding, reached out to him as a 13-year-old. And Will, as so many plant people are, were, was very generous with his knowledge and hooked him up with a rose breeding mentor. And so even as a young teenager, Dr. Zlesak was learning how to breed roses, learning how to grow roses, and um, has since developed a number of not just roses, but other plants as well. So um, one proven winner is perennial that you might be familiar with, Tuscan Sun Heliopsis. I love Tuscan Sun. I love I it mean, too. One of my favorite plants, Heliopsis. Yeah, so and, perennial sunflower. Yeah, uh, so they call it false sunflower. False sunflower, yeah. As opposed to Helianthus, but a short plant Gorgeous yellow blooms. I found with that plant that the uh, the flowers last for a long time, even in heat. Very bright and uh, and beautiful, long lasting. Yeah, mine are still. I would say full bloom, even though they've been blooming for about two months. That's a plant that I have. I probably have five of them in my garden, and I absolutely love it. And if you're familiar with other Heliopsis, they're often. Have you ever seen that, Rick? When they're covered in aphids, it's yes. a little bit creepy. That yes. doesn't happen. That doesn't happen with Tuscan Sun. So, <laughs> if you've had a bad experience with Heliopsis, reconsider with uh, David Zlesak's Tuscan Sun. Um, and he has also developed a number of Ageritum or um, the annual uh, ageritum, which is also known as floss flower. So he has a really diverse approach to plant breeding. He's not just into roses, but when he breeds roses, his primary goal is cold tolerance. So he has developed a number of roses that are very, very suitable to very harsh conditions. A lot of people don't think of roses as a particularly sure. hardy plant, and that's why traditionally so many roses were grafted, because they just didn't have the hardiness to survive winter on their own, so they would graft them onto a hardier rootstock. So what David, what Dr. Zlesak aims to do is to develop roses that naturally have that cold tolerance and don't need any special fussing. They're not grafted. They are own root roses. Well, and the fascinating thing, when you delve into the stories of some of these developers, in many cases, they found a plant out in the field that was outperforming other plants, or it stood out, and they noticed it, paid attention, and developed that plant. And in my reading, I found that Tuscan Sun was the same way also. That Oh, yeah, that it's uh, just really outstanding, so much different than it any of out. the other. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really does. Uh, I, I do love that plant, and I think it's a great testament to um, his talents as a plant breeder and plantsman because, you know, plant breeding is art and science, and that's something that I think listeners will come to fully understand as they listen to more and more Plants on Trial segments um, because we're really, that's such an important part of every plant that's not just in the Proven Winners brand, but in any plant brand that um, it has a story. You know, mm -hmm. it didn't just appear out of materialize out of thin air or right. in a laboratory somewhere. There are people and stories behind every single plant. And that's one of the things that I'm most excited to share during Plants on Trial. Uh, another great feature of Oh So Easy Peasy Rose is, uh, do you have Japanese beetles in your garden? Oh, my. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that Oh So Easy Peasy Rose is uh, is t Japanese beetle resistant. It is not. There are really no plants that are truly Japanese beetle resistant unless the beetles just don't want to eat them in the first place. But you know how I was talking about how it puts on those waves of sure. blooms? Mm -hmm. What that means is that if the Japanese beetles do destroy one of those waves of blooms, 
that it gives them a chance to move on Mm -hmm. and go somewhere else or die, complete their life cycle. And then you, you can still get flowers. So it's almost nature's mean, a, a means of pruning. Yeah. The plant and so or deadheading the plant. Yeah, backup plant. And if the plant is properly fed, and Stacy, what's your recommendation on sunlight for the landscape roses or oh so easy peasy? Right. Full sun. All roses, you're gonna want at least six hours of good, bright sunlight every day. And you know, with that, I would say if you have a spot for six with six hours of bright sunlight and oh so easy peasy rose sounds like a good fit. I would suggest that you visit your local independent garden center and ask for it by name or just look for it in the distinctive white proven winners container. Now, don't forget to visit our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com to get a little sneak preview of that and start to imagine what it will look like in your garden. We're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we will be answering some of the garden questions that we've gotten over the last couple of weeks. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show with Rick Weist and Stacy Hervella. I am Stacy Hervella, and it is time for the Garden Mailbag. Now, Rick, Yay. you said <laughs> that people might not know what a mailbag is, and and I would say mailbags still exist. You know, if you have a, a post a postal person who delivers on foot, they've got a mailbag. Um, but you know, mailbag might be one of those things like um, you know dialing a phone or rolling out the window that just stays idiomatic. The actual meaning that it had kind of goes away, but people still use the term. So garden mailbag it is. And, you know, like we said earlier in the show, it really is important to us that we are able to help you and answer your gardening questions. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us with your gardening questions, quandaries, conundrums, uh, celebrations at help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We will take a look at those and uh, read them on future segments. But to give you a little taste of the kinds of questions we will be answering, I pulled a few out of uh, Proven Winners feedback line. So this is a line where people come and ask questions. So I borrowed a couple out of there. And I'm starting with an interesting one here. This one comes from Lisa in Seattle, Washington. And she says, can you suggest plants to keep cats out of my yard? Now, I know Lisa's pain. Uh, I have two neighbors with outdoor cats, which is uh, makes me a little uncomfortable because I am a gardening for the birds kind of person. Um, but, you know, we all share the same neighborhood. So cats have, it is. I have a suggestion. Suggest to them they build what I call a catio. <laughs> a heard catio. Catios. You know, an outdoor cat enclosure to save your garden and birds and other wildlife. And the cats still get to go outside. See how that goes. Because it's an enclosed area. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me like Lisa does not have cats of her own. She has neighbor cats stopping by her yard. And Lisa, um, I don't want to start off on a down note, but I regret to inform you that there is no plant that is going to be cat kryptonite. There is no single plant that you're going to be able, or even multiple plants, that you're going to be able to plant, and then the cats are going to be like, nope, not going in there. It's Plants don't really work that way. Cats don't really work that way. Um, but that said, so I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for. You probably were hoping that I would just say, oh, yeah, plant this, and the cats will never come around again. But there are some things that you can do. So number one, most important, is to not plant or allow any cat attracting plants in your yard. So that means catnip. Now you might say, well, of course I don't want cats in my yard. I'm not planting catnip. But catnip, the plant, is actually a pretty uh, aggressive weed in some areas. It can pop up abundantly on its own. So you may not even know it, but you might have catnip growing in your yard, in which case you have pinpointed the reason why those cats are visiting. So you want to get to know what that looks like, pull it out, and make sure you're not growing it. But in addition to the regular catnip that cats like so much, There are a number of other ornamental catnips, uh, like Walker's Low, which of course is one of the all-time classic uh, sun perennials, and Cat's Meow. So even though those are what are considered ornamental catnip, um, they do have some ability to attract cats. They definitely are not as strongly scented as the regular catnip, um, but I would say you should definitely avoid anything that the cats might be overly curious about uh, in terms of planning your garden. And if you already have those, maybe move them to another area or share them with a friend. Now, from my experience in the garden, open soil areas uh, become a problem. And so trying to eliminate some of those, in some cases, I have had listeners through the years who have embedded 
some chicken wire or some kind of wire in the soil just below the surface. That's helped deter the cats. As far as plants are concerned, lemon thyme, lavender, rosemary, even geraniums or Russian sage, yeah, they may help deter cats. But the problem, Stacy, is if you take that approach, you're going to fill your whole yard full of those plants in order to be effective. And that's just not practical. Now, if you go online and you go to search engines to look, you see this plant called scaredy cat plant. And I took a look at that. They, they call it coleus canina. Mm. And it's not really a coleus. It's a plectranthus. Plectranthus also has a real scent to it. But again, the point is, if we are to put plants in the yard that are going to simply deter the cats, your yard will be full of those plants, and then we can't enjoy some of the beauties we want to plant, right? It's true. Your garden should have, hopefully, other goals besides uh, keeping the cats exactly. away. Um, and, you know, I have heard, this is this is definitely a, a wild card fact, but in the years that I've been corresponding with gardeners, I have had several people tell me that their neighborhood cats are uh, totally irresistibly attracted to Wygela. So going back to, we were no talking way, about the, really? per, yeah, we were talking about the pronunciation of the plant Wygela. And I have had several people tell me that the cats make a beeline to Wygela hmm. in their yard. They roll on it. Now, I don't know if it's specifically when it's in flower and the flowers have some nectar and the cats attracted to the sweetness, but I have had multiple people tell me over the years that they seem to be particularly attracted to Wygela, which is not related to catnip. Well, now, Stacy, I know that cats, uh, I, I can tell you this. I know that cats do not buy plants online. They always use a cat log. Sorry. Uh, Continue. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I was wondering where you're going with I it, know. and now I'm kicking myself for not seeing that ahead of time. Just continue on. All right, right. So uh, another thing that you can do, now, again, this is not going to be a silver bullet or cat kryptonite, but um, you can try some thorny plants. So barberry, for example, if it's not banned where you live. Cactus, I grow a hardy cactus, not specifically to keep cats out, but it is very thorny. I like them. Yeah, they're pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that will, that can, especially if you place those plants at an area where you know the cats are entering your yard, that can really help deter them because, you know, no one wants to get poked with a prickle. Hardy so. cactus. If I say apuntia, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, Stacey? that's what I say. Oh, I, I, I probably say apuntia, but that, that's, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Either way, you know, I do love that plant. Um, and like you said, yeah, definitely if you have exposed soil, especially exposed sandy soil, anything that might look like a litter box to a cat, you want to make that look less like a litter box. And that should get you a little bit closer to a cat free yard. Sounds good. Yeah, and clean up well also. You know, the scent, maybe some water, draining through some of the scent, that also helps too. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to move on to a question from Nancy in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who asks, do I need to add a base to my Blue Rose of Sharon to keep the color blue as in hydrangea bushes? Uh, and Nancy, the answer is no. So uh, a lot of people are familiar with this very unique characteristic, that big leaf uh, hydrangea macrophylla and mountain hydrangeas, hydrangea serrata have, and that is that their flower color is impacted by the chemical makeup of the soil based on the pH, based on other elements that are present, which, you know, I, we have lots of information on our website, provenwinnerscolorchoice.com. If you need that information, not going to go too into it or we'll go well into the next segment. Um, so those are really, though, the only plants that change their color based on soil chemistry. And a lot of people are surprised to find out find that out because they're so used to, you know, this, this, uh, strange thing, you know, happening for hydrangeas. But the answer is no, you do not need to add uh, anything to the soil to keep your blue rose of Sharon blue, as long as the plant gets enough sun. So we're looking at, again, uh, this is a full sun plant. So at least six hours of bright sunlight every single day and is kept happy and healthy. You should be getting nice blue flowers on your Rose of Sharon uh, without any chemical assistance. For years doing a radio show, many of our questions were related to hydrangeas. And you mentioned the website, Stacy Hydrangeas Demystified, I believe is on that website. Am I yes. correct? And yeah. That's so helpful to people. 
Yeah, so we created Hydrangea's Demystified uh, information sheet several years ago uh, because we had so, so many questions about hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. I I also used to do a radio show, and I used to joke that if I had a nickel for every hydrangea question (laughs) that I got, I would be able to retire. And that has only become more true uh, in my most recent gig here. So, But we do love to answer hydrangea questions, and don't worry, there will be plenty of hydrangea content down the pipeline here. Okay, one quick last question that I just want to talk about. Judy from Reno, Nevada, said she planted pink potentillas, and the blossoms were pink when she planted them, uh, and she hasn't done anything weird, and now all of a sudden they're blooming white. And I thought this was a good question to kind of piggyback off of Nancy's question, um, because one thing that can happen to certain plants is that they do lose some color uh, during hot nights. Yes. So plants synthesize their color pigments, the the colors, the, the, the chemicals that are responsible for their flower color at night, and when nighttime temperatures are really high they can't do that so you might notice especially if you live in a hotter climate like reno or a dry climate you might notice some color change there but you'll know that nothing's actually wrong because as the season progresses and the nights get cooler and longer that color will return it's kind of like what we're talking about seeing uh the second wind or third wind of the oh so easy peasy roses sure and the fewer the pigments the lighter the color as far as flowers are concerned and you're so right uh in hot sun and in the summertime sometimes we'll lose that but what about minerals or ph in the soil what's your opinion stacy can that ever have an effect on lightening of color in flowers uh primarily only in hydrangea macrophylla yeah yep yep so uh we are going to have to take a quick break and then rick is going to be back with his news stories talking about a lot of fascinating things and you won't want to miss it so please stay tuned Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show with me, Rick Weist, and Stacy Hervella. And Stacy, this time of the year, I love watching the monarch butterflies dancing around the flowers and preparing to head to Mexico. I've been to Mexico a number of times, and it's a rather tiring trip for me. I can't imagine being a butterfly having to head all the way to Mexico. No, and have you have you ever been there for the migration? Because there are tours that go to see the migration, and wow, does that look incredible. Amazing. And for folks here in West Michigan, the uh, or in Michigan, the annual fall migration of the monarch butterflies is about to get underway. This is the fourth generation, so spring monarchs, they're great-great-grandchildren. Those are the ones that are going to hit the road for Mexico to overwinter on these migration routes called flyways. And Stacy, here in Michigan, as I understand it, there are a couple of monarch hotspots. And this is the first item here on our news segment. There's always something going on in the garden, in nature, in the landscape. And like I said in the initial segment, we're not going to call it breaking news. We're going to call it branching news. And Here's the two monarch hotspots, Stonington Peninsula in Michigan. Have you ever been there? I have not. Upper Peninsula near Escanaba. Uh, That is one. And the other is Tawas Point State Park. Both of those areas, they say if you're there at the right time, the monarchs congregate as they prepare to head to Mexico. Well, that sounds amazing. And I know Tawas Point is a hotspot for birders as well here in Michigan. Um, I would posit a third hotspot, and that might be my backyard, because I plant (laughs) a lot of uh, perennials, especially native perennials, um, all sorts of milkweed to sustain and attract monarchs through the season. And uh, yeah, they are going uh, crazy in my yard right now, and it is really a delight. Yeah, the verbenas, the butterfly bush uh, is just loaded with monarch butterflies right now as they prepare. You want to make a little extra money, the DNR is offering $100 per bushel in September, a little extra pocket change, if you're willing to pick fresh cones from red pine trees and then drop them off by appointment at a number of DNR locations across the upper and northern lower peninsulas. So they're looking for you to collect up red pine cones where red pine are most abundant, and that's generally in the upper and northern lower peninsula. Two five-gallon buckets of fresh red pine cones. It's going to pocket you, Stacy, up to $100. That's up from $75 per bushel last year. 
Wow. That Inflation. A, that's some cash, you know, and that's a great way to keep your kids busy if you're camping. Tell them they can, can gather up the pine cones and then they can keep the money or, you know, at least half of it. Yeah. And the complication here, of course, is that they want, they want you to pick them from living red pine trees where branches extend close to the ground. So they don't want them off the ground. They actually want them off the trees. But you could make yourself a little bit of extra money by doing that. Yeah, and you better look up what a red pine looks like before you go out and just exactly. snap pine cones off the tree. But that DNR website does have some information about that. And of course, we will put that in the show notes on our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So if you are interested in making a little pocket change with pine cones, you can find the details there. I love it. Now, the royal family in England picked up on this this past week. The queen's granddaughter has been working a near minimum wage job this summer at a garden center in England. I thought that that was great. Lady Louise Windsor, she's 18 years old, and she's working in a garden center. Now, I know for myself and for many people, working in a garden center when you're young is a great experience. You learn a lot. And, uh, yeah, the uh, let's see, her name, uh, Lady Louise Windsor, 18 years old, working in a garden center, helping people pick out their plants. And, I love and that. And I'll bet her name tag just says Louise, and, and everyone's just like, hey, Louise, can you help me with this? Uh, I got a couple <laughs> questions here. You've got yeah, it. Yeah, hard to imagine. You've got it, exactly. So $6 a square foot to rip up your lawn. I have noticed in the news, and all of us have seen this, the concerns regarding lack of water. I have a number of friends who live in Southern California, and Stacy, they've adopted their methods of gardening and some of the plants that they put in the ground. Uh, just talked to a friend this past week who told me that there's some neighbor shaming going on in her neighborhood also for people who are perceived to be using too much water. And so offers are being made at as much as $6 a square foot to rip up your lawn. That is, uh, you don't have to twist my, arm. I'd do it for free, actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of, I would rather have, gar you know, lawn is plants, but I would much rather have gardens than lawn. And like I said, I, I, I garden for birds and, and butterflies. So uh, more, more room means more plants for those. And that makes me very happy. Well, and the argument here is that grass is the lar uh, single largest irrigated crop, crop in quotations, in America surpassing corn and wheat. Really? Well, those are both grasses too, so that's that, interesting. <laughs> that is incredible. And so they're they're having to adapt and you know, it causes me to think about the fact how blessed we are here where we're broadcasting from in West Michigan, the fresh water that we have. Uh, here where we live. And typically reliable rainfall, which is the best kind of water at all because it's free and you don't have to do anything. Now, I've also been following in the news spotted lanternfly, uh, and it's been, quote, spotted in Michigan. Uh, spotted lanternfly, of course, has been hitchhiking across much of the northeastern United States since its discovery in southeastern Pennsylvania. 2014, I think, was the year, but Stacy, they found a small localized population in Oakland County, the first known occurrence of live spotted lantern flies in Michigan. This is a real concern. It is a real concern. And, you know, this is an invasive pest. So it has come from abroad and it has no uh, known uh, predators yet. So it can really proliferate. It is uh, preying on a number of important ornamental crops like our trees and also really uh, stands to cause major issues for the brewing wine and cider industries. So anytime you get something with an agricultural threat like that, it's worth uh, all of our uh, uh, time to pay attention to that. Yeah, it's uh, it's of concern, and we're going to have to keep an eye on that spotted lantern fly and, if you want to look that up. And, you know, they're asking people to step on them or to smash yes. them. And honestly, a lot of people are saying, no, I, I could <laughs> never do that. But um, I would urge you, if you do, you know, look up what a spotted lantern fly looks like, I would urge you to do join in that movement um, because by taking that action, we can actually take a number of potential spotted flies 
out of the game, you know, when you look at insect reproduction over time, um, it really compounds quickly. So yes, absolutely. It might not feel like you're making a big difference if you kill just one spotted lanternfly, but over time it will. So please uh, be part of that movement and help out. And we can also put more information about that in the show notes. Absolutely. And finally, in branching news, this is exciting, Stacy Artemis. One, that is the spacecraft where eventually we're going to have uh, astronauts on the moon again in a few years. Uh, the launch was supposed to take this week, uh, take place this week. It was scrubbed. But here's the interesting thing. M- Michigan State University is sending seeds to space aboard Artemis One because, believe it or not, there are no grocery stores or vegetable gardens on the moon. And so we got to be thinking about long-term Uh, existence on the moon and how are we going to eat and people eat plants and they should and they should and it will be very interesting to see uh, the results of those experience fabulous so time to run stacy time flies when you're having fun but we want to remind people gardening simplified on air.com if you want to learn more it's your one-stop shop for everything you just heard we have to say thank you also to uh, phil tower for helping us launch our first edition of the Gardening Simplified show. Also, John Ilk and Tim Fagan with iHeartMedia. And, of course, the one and only Adriana Robinson behind the soundboard and camera. Thank you for your expertise, as well as Shannon Downey, who is our graphic designer, and Tori Van Tameren, our web designer. Stay grounded, my friends. We'll talk to you next week.